Well, listen, I want to tell you guys how much I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to join us here this week on uh, Capitol Hill. The work that we're doing together as an industry is making a difference. It's making a big impact on the narrative that's taking place here in Washington, D.C., on behalf of the industry, on behalf of small businesses. And uh, we're just so thrilled that so many people are taking the time to do what we're doing here this week. So I couldn't be more thrilled. Um, but I do have um, a couple of things that we'd like to do. I'd like to bring Andy Gabler up. He's our president this year, as you all know. Andy, give, it, give Andy a big round of applause. Andy's on the tip of the spear this year on your behalf as your acting president. I'd just like to invite him to the podium to make a few statements. Andy? Yeah, I have to lower it. I would just like to thank each and every one of you for coming down here to echo what uh, Steve Jordan has said. I mean, it's, we couldn't do this without you. It's just like this sign says, make your voice heard. If you ask any of these guys over here, the only way they know what to do is if we tell them, and that's what we're doing here today. So thanks for being here. Um, once again, I'd like to thank uh, Mike Kelly for coming down. He's actually my congressman. I can remember the day I met Mike. A friend of mine worked at the Business uh, Association in Erie, PA, and she said, you got to come down. You know, uh, I, I got a guy that's trying to get in and uh, come down and meet him. You know, he's a car dealer, too. And I'm like, well, all right. I you know, really wasn't into politics, but I'm hanging up my coat in the coat room, and uh, there's this guy comes in, starts hanging up his coat. And he goes, hey, I'm Mike Kelly. How are you? I'm like, so he started telling me a little bit about himself, and, and we really, we've been friends ever since. Um, He's going to tell us a little bit about what he thinks we need to do, and we've got to stand behind him. We've got to stand behind both these guys. They, they're here for us. These guys are car dealers. You know, you know they, they understand us. And uh, I thank you all for being here once again, and that's it. All right, thank you, Andy. So it's exciting to, um, to be on Capitol Hill, and um, you know, there's probably an old saying, and I'm probably butchering it, but uh, when, when family comes to town, you break bread together. And the next person that I want to bring up to the podium is somebody that we truly consider to be family. Uh, he's a dear friend. He's uh, right in our district uh, in Arlington, the DFW Fort Worth area. He is the inaugural um, NIADA Legislator of the Year recipient. Uh, he's no stranger to anybody in this room and certainly doesn't need my introduction. I'd like to bring to the podium Congressman Roger Williams. You the man. You the man, buddy. Well, thank you very much, and it's good to be with all of you. It's been, uh, it seemed like I just saw you last night. <laughs> and I know that you checked uh, back home on how many you sold this morning already, right? Volumes up and the gross is down, is what I was told. From, But it's a great honor to be here, and uh, uh, even a, a greater, as great, as great honor to be with one of my buddies, uh, a fellow car dealer uh, and, a, and a good friend. So here's the deal. We got three car dealers in Congress, three of us. And uh, the Washington Post did an interview with me the other day, said, uh, Congressman, what do we need to turn things around in Congress. I said, we need more car dealers. <laughs> and I think she thought I was kidding, but I really wasn't kidding. We need more car dealers, right? But uh, uh, we got three car dealers in Congress, and I think it's evident, too, what we need in Congress is we need more business people. We need business people that will start you up here, you hit me down here, and we'll find somewhere in the middle. We need more of that, and we know that's our industry. We need people that played football at Notre Dame for the fighting Irish. But we also need people up here, like we all have in our industry, people of common sense, that understand we may not agree with each other all the time, but there's somewhere we can make something happen. And we need people of common sense. And we need people that'll make a deal. Uh, we're missing that right now. And we need somebody up here that understands that the good deal might sell that first one, right? But service, servicing our constituents, serving our country, the second, the third, and the fourth time 
is what brings us back and brings business and brings strength to our businesses. We need people like that. We need people, more than ever up here in Congress, that understand that interest is not income. Interest is an expense, right? And they will support and stand hand in hand with me and him on interest deductibility. That's what we need up here in Congress. And that's what we have in Mike Kelly. Mike Kelly is a good man, and that's the most important thing. He's a great business guy. He gets it. He understands it. And he doesn't mind telling you about it. He'll tell you when he's bad. He'll tell you when he's good. And that's what we need. So this award, uh, it was an honor for me to receive it last year. But having Mike Kelly receive it this year makes my award even better to have him on the team. So I want to bring up Mike, but let me tell you, Mike is a friend of yours. Mike is a friend of mine. Mike is a friend of America. And Mike is a friend of this industry. So come on up here, Mike. It's a pleasure to introduce you. It's a pleasure to call you my friend. And I just want to say one more thing and make it public. Any of y'all trying to buy cars from Kelly? You get your best deal, and I'll beat it by 100, okay? <laughs> you the man. I'm going to give you this award. Yeah, and that always works, doesn't it? We're going to throw in rust proofing, too, though. Okay. Let me give you this award first. Okay. And then you talk, because i got to go vote. <laughs> but, Mike, this oh, boy, is a this great is award yeah, that, uh, seriously, I got last year. It's proudly displayed in my office, as many of you come and seen it. But when you get recognized by your peers and by your family, that's the biggest honor of all. God bless you. Thank you, brother. Okay, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. But most of us start our days the same way, and that is with some type of a sales meeting to get our people excited about their opportunity that day to solve people's needs, their transportation needs. What can we do to, to, to showcase a product that has made America great? It's always been our ability to have private Private transportation, I mean, this is an incredible thing. My dad, by the way, uh, people say, well, how'd you get in this business? And Roger and I got in this business the same way. We were born into the business. Uh, my dad was a parts picker at a Chevrolet warehouse in Pittsburgh before the war. Uh, he went off to war, he came back home. The, the commitment he had for Mr. Murphy, R.P. Murphy, who was his own manager in Pittsburgh at that time, when my dad left for the war, was, Mr. Murphy, if I survive and come back here, no Kelly has ever worn a white shirt to work in their lives. Would I have that opportunity? And Mr. Murphy told him, you know what? George, you survive, you survive that war. You come back home, and we'll get you that job. And my dad did survive. But not only did he come home, a lot of other guys came home at the same time. And there weren't enough white shirts to go around. So my dad was really deeply disappointed. He wasn't able to walk into some type of a job where he could actually wear a white shirt to work. But Mr. Murphy did keep his promise to him. And then shortly thereafter, he became a guy who was on the road selling parts to dealers, right? Uh, he, then he became zone promotion manager. Then he became a Chevrolet dealer in a little town called Verona, uh, a one-car showroom and about six service bays. And that was seven days a week, seven days a week that they ran that store. Well, my grandfather, when my dad told him, you know what, Pop? I got a chance to become a dealer, and I'm going to take that chance. My grandfather said, oh, my God, son, what are you doing? Why would you ever leave a job? You're the first Kelly to ever wear a white shirt to work. And they give you a company card, don't they? My dad says, yeah, they do. They do. He goes, well, what's wrong with you? You got it made. And my dad said, listen, I'll tell you what happened, Pop. Now, remember, these were all, at that time, most of the zone offices were all row offices, right? So you understand what I mean? Everybody had their own little office, but there was glass between them. My dad was in an office next to the zone managers. He overheard a conversation between the, the zone manager and an assistant zone manager about a promotion. And as they were having this discussion, the zone manager and the assistant zone manager could not come to a decision as who should get the promotion. And you know how they arrived at who should get the promotion? They flipped a coin. And my dad said, that moment in his life when he said, if it ever comes down to not what I've done, but whether I'm on the right side of the coin, I'm in the wrong business. So he left there and became a dealer, and, and the rest was really, uh, we worked all our lives. I didn't, I didn't realize, I, I thought everybody uh, that I grew up with, uh, dad was in the car business. I didn't realize that, that 
in our neighborhood, we were the only ones, but my dad and mom worked seven days a week. You know, my dad was a parts picker in the warehouse before the war. My mother was actually the telephone operator at that same zone office, the parts office. So it, it, they came from the same background. Everything was fine with me till the Obama administration came into being. And all of a sudden, General Motors was no longer General Motors. It was called Government Motors. And I was a Chevrolet Cadillac dealer. Uh, and, and there was a decision made. I got a 39-page letter in the mail. And, and the first 38 and a half pages meant nothing to me. It was just, just all just talk. And then the last part was the one that was really important. It was about, you will be giving up your Cadillac franchise. Just sign below, and we'll let you go ahead and, and creep out of the room quietly, and we'll give you, I think it was $25,000 for 60-some uh, years of work, which I thought was atrocious. So, you know, we could do a couple of things. Number one, we could either sign off on the letter and then go quietly into the dark and not worry about it, or we could go to arbitration. I chose to go to arbitration. And, uh, and one, and one. Went to fight to keep our dealership, and my brother, or my son and I were talking about it, and I said, you know what, Brendan, I mean, thank God your father, or your grandpa's passed, and your grandma's passed, because this is not the General Motors that they grew up in, and this is not the country that your grandfather fought in World War II for, and this is certainly not the business where we just say, you know what, it's not worth the fight. I'll just give in. So we went to arbitration. We won. I did receive a, a phone call from a girl named Karen Rafferty, who at that point was one of our zone personnel, and she called me, and she says, Mike, uh, this is Karen Rafferty. I said, hey, Karen, how are you? She says, I'm good. I'm just calling to let you know we're going to let you keep the franchise. And this is after $60,000 invested in lawyers and fighting to keep something we already owned. It was in the second year of a five-year contract, right? And so I said, okay. And she said to me, well, aren't you going to thank me? I said, very rarely do I thank anybody that returns something that they stole. So that was my whole thing. And getting into this business, by the way, this right now, this, and Roger's right, when we stay on the sidelines, when we don't get not just involved but totally committed, we lose. And there's a saying out there that goes something like 90% of life is showing up because when you show up, people know you care. When you look at this, when you don't make your voice heard, except among your friends, and you tell them how bad things are, you say, well, you could have done something about it. What did you do? Well, I told my friends how upset I was. No, no, that's not the answer. Coming here to Washington, D.C. Now, the last group in was a Texas group, right? Because you were meeting with legislators somewhere. Would you please do me a favor? Don't ever stop meeting with legislators. Never, ever walk away from the opportunity to talk to legislators. Roger had told you, there's three of us, three, three car dealers in, a, in, in the Congress right now. Not in the Senate, by the way, but here, right here. What he and I talk about all the time is policy that affects our everyday not profitability, but survivability. Do you know you have people making policy every day that don't have a freaking clue about how your business works? You have people that are a whiz with a laptop, could not sell one iota of a product on blacktop, but they're going to make the policy that determines your ability to survive in a really competitive market. That's who we are, and that's who we have to be. And as soon as we walk away from it, it ends. And it's not retrievable. When we look at the last 18, 19 months, it would be hard for anybody to tell me, I'm not better off today than I was 18 months ago. And I don't care who you are or where you are or what you do. It's true across the board. It doesn't matter. The talking points are out there. You can see them all the time. You talk about record employment and record people not being employed. When you talk about the highest numbers we've ever seen in our history, and then people tell me, yeah, but I'm not sure we're on the right path. I said, well, then you need, you need to go talk to somebody and actually get educated because we are on the right path and we'll continue on the right path as long as we stay engaged. Now, one of the things when Roger and I were talking, I, th I think the hardest people for most of us to talk to, at least it has been for me in my lifetime, are, are people who actually are, are the manufacturers. I used to sit in a lot of dealer meetings, and what I couldn't understand is why at the dealer meetings do we have factory people sitting in there helping us de determine policy? And so in Chevrolet, I was in the Chevrolet, I was in the Chevrolet uh, dealers uh, in Pittsburgh and also in the Cadillac dealers in Pittsburgh. And so I would politely ask, I said, anybody who's not a, de a dealer, would you please leave the room? And they would be greatly offended. You know, it was half of the room? Half of the room? Do you know they were giving these people the ability to vote? 
I thought, were you kidding me? They don't have one penny involved. They don't have one minute involved. They don't have anything involved in us. And the fact of the matter is, in six months, they may be off. If they're with Cadillac, they, they, they may be with, with Nissan. They may be with Toyota. They may be with Hyundai. They, may be with they just keep moving around. They just keep moving around. So my, my stance was always, you better have dealers actually talking about policy that affects them and their survivability. That's who we are. We survive every single day. And when that window closes at the end of that day, we say, okay, fine, let's gather together, let's see the opportunities that are still on the table that we can still recapture tomorrow. So you come into work the next day with a plan of how are you going to do it again? How are you going to get there? How are you going to sell cars and trucks? How are you going to sell service? And Roger made a really good point. It's the service that keeps them coming back. It's your ability to relate with whatever community you live in and where people get to know you on a regular basis. I tell people all the time, and I know Raj does the same thing, if you want to see how important we are or how significant we are, go to where they play Little League Baseball and look at the outfield fence. Go open up any program to any high school event, a play, a concert, and you see whose name's on there. Look at anybody that has anything going on from a standpoint of they need help from business people, you know the first responders are us. We are the ones that are always there at every turn to support community activities. And some people tell me, you guys just do that for business. I said, you know what, I think it goes deeper than that. I really do. I think it, that we have a total commitment to the communities we live in. So, uh, you know, Raj and I have a chance to talk an awful lot about policy. He did make a mention uh, about the uh, interest deductibility. I never knew that it wasn't an expense. I wish somebody had explained that to me years ago. Because the, the factory has been making a huge mistake when they do their statements. Uh, <laughs> the other thing I was always, I always hated us putting out a statement because our friends in the manufacturing, we look at it, they'd find out where our profits are coming from and then go ahead and take over. So if you were doing a big job with extended warranties, then they say, we don't want that, that. The warranty often is okay, but it's not as good as the one we offer. And, and, and all of a sudden it became, and I say this all the time, and you all know this, uh, if you want something that's hot, you gotta buy a lot of stuff that's not. And so when I need trucks, I said, I need some more Silverados, I say, that's great. For every, for every four Impalas you buy from us, we'll give you one truck. I said, well, that's fine, but I can't sell Impalas. That's not what people are buying. But I can't sell those trucks. And they said, well, yeah, but then you know what? The problem is we made those in Palace, and somebody's got to digest them, so we're just going to pass them on to you. Listen, we've had the opportunity to talk about a lot of things. It does come down to policy. The one thing I will ask you, I will employ you. There's only three of us, Roger, myself, and Vern Buchanan. There's only three of us out of the 435 that sit in the house that actually have been in the business that you're in and understand what it is that you're going through. Uh, I think too often uh, people will tell me uh, when I talk to dealers and I talk to other people that are in business, because we're all doing the same thing. We're either selling a good or a service to somebody. Uh, people tell me, I don't like to get involved. I really try to stay out of politics. And I said, well, you know what? That's perfect for politicians. That's perfect. As soon as you stay out, they jump in. You know what I said earlier about 90% of life is showing up because when you show up, people know you care. You know what else happens? People know you know, and they know they don't know. We, we really do. We live in a bobblehead society where most pe people will say that something is going on. They go, oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. And I say, well, you, you, do you really? Oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. So then you start to go into it, and they don't know. I am going to share something with you, the difference between leadership and non-leadership, and the ability that some people have to look at whatever the challenge is and turn it into an opportunity and turn it, turn it into a success. And Roger and I have, have had the opportunity to get, uh, get to the point where we get to see the president on a one like this, you know, kind of more of an intimate thing than, than him showing up and there's 15,000 people cheering for him and you're on a stage behind him, but more of the one-on-one -on -one opportunities. I want to share something with you because people have been talking to me about, you know what, this guy with these tariffs, I mean, he is ruining. He is ruining our business. He's got to be so careful. We're at the White House. And this is before the tariffs were imposed, by the way. This is they were proposed, not imposed. There was about 35 members of Congress there. Long table. The president sits in the middle, his people ringing around him. I was down at the far end with uh, General Kelly, and people say, well, you get along with General Kelly really well. He knows you. I said, yeah, we have the same last name. 
And they'll say, yeah, but it seems like he knows you. I said, okay, we'll try this one more time. We have the same last name, so he does remember me. He and I are sitting down at the far end of the table, and as he's going around the table, he's asking people like, Christy Nome, tell me what's going on. Uh, and it goes, oh, Mr. President, this is horrible. These steel tariffs, these aluminum tariffs, it's absolutely, it's going to wreak havoc on us. We can't possibly, we can't possibly institute these tariffs. It's going to be terrible for business. Then he goes to Jackie Walorski, from, tell me, Jackie, what's going on out in Indiana? Tell me what it looks like in South Bend. Oh, Mr. T President, oh my gosh. These aluminum tariffs, you realize we make motor homes, we make travel trailers, we do, we do, we do, and it's all with aluminum, and you know what? What you're proposing is just gonna kill the business. It's gonna kill the business. He talked to a couple more members, then he kind of sits up, he goes, where's my car guy? And I said, I'm down here, Mr. President. He says, Mike, you'll appreciate this because you're a car guy. And I said, I have no idea what he's talking about, right? <laughs> he's talking about tariffs. I'm thinking, okay, yeah, I know what you're talking about. He goes, well, you know what, Mike? Now, there's other 34 other members, plus his cabinet sitting there listening to this. He goes, I got a call from the Saudi prince the other day. I said, oh, you did, sir? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, you know what? He starts the conversation after about five minutes into it. I said, whoa, excuse me, enough of the chit-chat. You got to send me a check for $4 billion. He said, that phone went dead. That phone went absolutely dead. And then it was after a little sputtering, well, but, 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 Mr. President, why would I need to send you a check for $4 billion? He said, no, Mike, follow this because you'll get it. And I'm thinking, I don't know where he's going with this. I said, yes, sir, I'm with you. He goes, he says, here's why you owe me $4 billion. You know, our daughters and sons in uniform, are over there defending you right now? Do you know they're putting their lives on the line? The American people are paying for all this? Do you know that our, our, all our equipment's over there protecting you? And you know what? You're not paying for it. You're getting it for nothing. You're getting, you're, it's too, it doesn't make any sense. You need to pay us. He goes, this is where, Mike, this is where it gets interesting. He goes, you know what he told me? He said, well, Mr. President, I'm sorry. I can't help you with that. He goes, okay, if you can't help me, that's okay. He goes, it's okay? He says, yep. He goes, oh, boy, that's, that's a relief. He goes, yeah, I'm bringing them all home. The guy says, what? He says, I'm bringing them all home. I'm going to bring all those people home, our sons and daughter, in uniform, willing to lay their lives on the line for you. I'm going to bring them home. You know what else I'm going to bring home? All our equipment. And we'll see how you do on your own. We'll do on your own. Little pause goes by, and the guy says, Mr. President, I'll have that check in the mail for you today. <laughs> he goes, Mike. He goes, Mike. Huh? I'll bet if I had asked that SOB for eight billion, I could have got seven. <laughs> so Roger already hit on this, and you know what I'm talking about. Because the president, after that, I got to tell you, that room, all of a sudden, those worried looks went to smiles. And he said, you know what, ladies and gentlemen, you don't deserve it if you don't ask for it. We've never asked for anything. We always cave in. We always give them what they want at our taxpayer expense, at the, at the, the risk of our, the lives of our sons and our daughters, and we think that somehow we have an ally. That is not an ally. That's an expense that we can no longer afford. So you better be willing to ask for it. And as Roger said, you can start up here and they can start down there, but somehow you come together in the middle, right? That's just the way it is because we want to get it off our lots and into somebody's driveway. It doesn't make any, it doesn't make any money for me when it sits there. So that's what we've been trying to do. And I think, I, I mean this sincerely, thank God we have a business person running the largest business the world has ever seen that has an idea of how it's supposed to be run and understands that you can't just sit back and continue to lose market share year after year after year and somehow feel good about it. In 1970, when I graduated from Notre Dame and came into our dealership in Butler, Pennsylvania, Chevrolet, not General Motors, Chevrolet, had 25% of price class. That means that one out of every four new cars sold in 1970 was a Chevrolet car. When it came to weight class, which is the trucks, we had 33% of weight class. One out of three new trucks sold in 19, 1970 was a Chevrolet truck. Do you know where we are today? I'm not talking about Chevrolet. I'm talking all GM. We're bragging to the fact that we may have 14 and a half or 15 percent of the market. And I said, you know, that's a far cry from when we had almost over 50 percent of the market. 
And if we're standing up pounding our chest and saying we're doing one hell of a job, but you know what? Just look at the records. That's all you got to do. But you know what? You got to ask for it. You got to come up with a product that makes sense, that has, that has benefits and features that add value to whoever our buyer is. That's what you're all doing. So the only thing I'm asking you is today, please don't ever walk away from the chance to get full list for what it is that you're selling. Please don't ever allow anybody to browbeat you. Please do not allow anybody who's never, ever produced one iota of revenue on his or her own to develop policy telling you what you need to do. That is absolutely unconscionable. But we see it every day, and that's our fight. That's what we fight for every single day is the fact that we have a placeholder here that makes sure we're covering our needs and what we, and what we deserve and what we deserve. Uh, all of you, when you go home, please take a look at your economic footprint. Take a look about what you do in your communities. Secondly, please take a look at what you do for Social Security. That 6.2% out of every paycheck that matches whatever your associate gets, 12.4% out of every single paycheck goes to Social Security, up to 128 grand, right? What does Social Security work off of? Wage taxes. Who pays wage taxes? Working people in the businesses. I told Kevin Brady, who's the chairman of our committee of Ways and Means, I said, you know what, Kevin, you may not believe this, but there was about four times in my life I have not paid one penny in tax. He goes, man, who, who did your taxes for you? I said, it didn't matter who did my taxes. We didn't make any money that year. He goes, what do you mean? I said, we pay taxes on profits. We don't pay taxes when we don't make money. So the goal should be, how do we do pro-growth pro -growth tax reform? This guy stood up in our conference because it was hard to get it across about what it is that we do. And what's in a true expense? I was told at one time advertising wasn't an expense. That's odd. That's odd. Uh, so people, but again, people who've never done what you've done, people that don't have the same model that you have, are making policy for you. Why are they making policy for you? Because we put them in the position to make policy. And I don't care if it's in your hometown, your home county, your home state, or the United States. There's not one person, there's not one person in any of these elected positions that just walks in and sits down. Every single one of them gets voted into office. And so when people ask me, say, what do you think happened? I said, I'll tell you what I think happened. We stopped paying attention. When we stop paying attention, we lose market share. And when we stop losing market share, we lose our future. And when we lose our future, we don't only cash in our future, but we cash in our children and our grandchildren's future. So you just being here today is incredibly important. You've got to be here. And you've got to be able to clearly identify the issues that you have with the people who serve you. They serve you. They serve you. So listen, I'm going to tell you, this is, this is really great. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. Uh, and Roger and I are going to go vote here in a couple minutes. Uh, and uh, that comes sometimes can get real sticky too, depending on what the issue is. Uh, but again, thank you for all you do. Thank you for all you do, not just for our country, but what you do for the communities that you're in and for the people that you work with every day. I don't call them employees anymore. They're all associates, right? So, I mean, just employer-sponsored insurance, pension plans that we, that we get people, we give them security. We give them that faith to go into their retirement years, go into those golden years with a little gold. We make it a little bit easier for them. That's you. That's what you do. And without you, the country would fail. So listen, thank you so much for this. I appreciate it. God bless you. And please, keep on coming. Keep on coming. Keep on coming. Thank you all.